Hey, and welcome to Open, the show opening the Bronx and the rest of the world to you. I'm Brittany Schuyler Albain, covering for Darren Jaime, and today we'll update you on what's happening in and around our borough in New York City. Coming up, we will delve into the challenges faced by caregivers and explore the initiatives that can offer them vital support. After that, get ready to discover an all-in-one food truck app with unique features setting it apart from other food delivery platforms. Finally, we will learn about a nonprofit organization dedicated to expanding existing oyster reef restoration efforts in New York City. So stay tuned, all this and much more is headed your way because we're now officially open. Hey everyone, I'm Brittany Schuyler Albain and you are now watching Open, a live program bringing the Bronx and New York City straight to you. Don't forget to stay connected with us via social media at BronxNet TV. Some things have been going on throughout this past week. We'll take you through it right now with some Bronx updates. We begin with the recurring news of fires in the Bronx, which has been a cause for concern in recent times. Last month, a devastating five alarm fire raged uncontrollably for hours in the Soundview section of the Bronx. Just a few days later, the Wakefield community suffered a tragic incident when two people lost their lives in a three alarm fire. Residents have expressed concerns about defective fire detectors on the premises. In another incident, 10 people were injured when a lithium ion battery caught fire while charging causing significant damage to the residents. And as recently as last week, a fast-moving fire broke out in the Union Port section of the Bronx, resulting in injuries to eight people, including seven firefighters. Worrying lease statistics from last year revealed that six out of the top 10 New York City districts with the highest number of fires in 2020 were located in the Bronx. The impact of these fires goes beyond the immediate damage. They lead to displacement, homelessness, loss of income for businesses, compromised air quality, heightened asthma risks, and long-lasting asthma for those affected. Everyone must be well informed about fire safety measures. You can educate yourself on fire safety at NewYorkCity.gov. Let's stay vigilant and take protective steps to prevent such incidents from occurring in the future. In other news, in celebration of the 50th anniversary of hip-hop, there's exciting news to share. Mayor Eric Adams, in association with It's All, a, it's All Black Music Presents and KRS-One, is delighted to announce the commencement of a special event, the 5x5 Block Party Series. This Golden Jubilee celebration will kick off on August 5th and run until August 12th. The 5x5 Block Party Series promises an exceptional experience for hip-hop enthusiasts and music lovers alike. Featuring a stellar lineup of renowned DJs and influential artists, attendees can expect an unforgettable journey through the history and evolution of hip-hop. Alongside the music, the event will also showcase captivating street art installations, delectable food vendors, interactive experiences, and enlightening educational entertainment talks. To add even more magic this momentous occasion, the city is collaborating with Pixies Drones to present a breathtaking free drone light show dedicated to honoring iconic hip-hop imagery. The highlight of this celebratory event will be the Bronx's block party, scheduled for Saturday, August 12th from 1 p.m. to 9.30 p.m., held at the historic 1520 Sedgwick Avenue, where the roots of hip-hop originated. The party promises to be an authentic and soulful experience. Don't miss this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to join in commemorating the rich legacy of hip-hop and its profound impact on global music culture. Mark your calendars and get ready to groove to the rhythm of the history at the 5x5 Block Party Series. In education news, in its second year of participation in the Bloomberg Summer Boost program, Dream Charter School celebrated a significant victory as its students successfully defied the summer learning loss trend. Our BronxNet reporter Kyrie Moody has all the details. With year two of receiving help from the Bloomberg Summer Boost program, students at Dream Charter School beat the summer learning loss trend. We just go to the gym and we do lots of fun things. Wow. Like run around and play music. 
with a music speaker. DREAM continues to host its free summer programming for more than a thousand students in East Harlem and the South Bronx. Students in first through eighth grades enjoy morning academic work focused on math and reading, followed by afternoons filled with physical activity. Basically, I coach the kids, essentially like the teachers, help them with like clubhouse activities, whether that be math, ELA. Um, I go to the park with them. We go to um, McComas Park, Yankee Stadium. To have other soccer, baseball, stuff like that. Louise Phillips is the director of outer school time and athletics. Louise tells us more. Here at Dream, we have um, extended year and extended day programming. Um, so I, I manage basically our out of school time, which is after school and summer program. Parents struggle to put their child in affordable after school programs and summer programs. However, Dream understands the struggle. What makes DREAM unique is that, um, I want to speak more specifically of our summer program. It is a free program for all of our students who have the exclusive opportunity to join. We provide everything that's needed for, for our program and even the school year. So whether that be school supplies, um, our electronic devices, so tablets, laptops. Um, we go on amazing field trips. As you have heard from the various testimonies, this summer program is a kicker. For BronxNet, Kyrie Moody. Thanks, Kyrie. That's all for the Bronx updates. We have to take a quick break, but we'll have more open when we return. drug dealer and I'll be your sub today. Can you see anything different as a pill? No. No. You don't know? Fentanyl is being mixed into everything now. There's only one thing that will save somebody's life. That is naloxone nasal spray. Fentanyl is cheap, it's potent, and it's profitable. Why would drug dealers put a lethal dose of fentanyl in drugs if they know it's so harmful? Really just all about the money. I just didn't realize that one pill could change your whole life. More kitchen now. My character, Shazam, knows all about growing up in a family full of teenage superheroes. They're bold. Where's everyone going? To fight crime. OK. Adventurous. Shazam! There's never a dull moment. And no matter what happens, they'll always have your back. All they need is a place to grow and be themselves. And the best part is, you don't have to be a superhero to adopt a teen. Learn more about adopting a teen from foster care. Visit AdoptUSKids.org. You can't imagine the reward. Welcome back. Over 48 million Americans generously care for their parents, spouses, grandparents, and other loved ones, enabling them to maintain their independence. In New York alone, caregivers provide an astounding $39 billion in unpaid care annually, assisting with medical needs, meals, and more. Many caregivers also bear personal expenses and make sacrifices in their careers, reducing work hours or leaving their jobs to provide care. Joining us to tell us more and provide further insight is the director of AARP New York State, Beth Frank, Beth Finkel. Beth, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. So, I mean, to start off, 48 million caregivers. Essentially, how does one even assume that role? Well, we all have loved ones or neighbors or people that we care about, and we want to make sure that we follow their wishes which we know from ARP surveys forever, that um, almost eight in 10 people want to age in their own homes and communities. And we want to be respectful of that. We want to make sure that they can age with dignity and make the choices they want as they age. So as loved ones or as good friends and neighbors, we sometimes step up and we become caregivers. 
And when that happens, can you tell me a little bit about the responsibilities of a family caregiver? What does that entail and what challenges do they face? You know, it really varies. Sometimes it's chore services. Sometimes it's bill paying. Sometimes it's taking care of their personal needs. Uh, you know, there these activities of daily living have, have help getting dressed, help with feeding, uh, help with, um, you know, as I said before, personal needs. There's a variety of things that people need to remain in their own homes. It's kind of like a continuum. And so that's what people provide. And sometimes people don't even realize, you know, how much effort that is and how much pressure it puts on the family caregiver. Yeah, and so in a recent study, as we mentioned, New York caregivers provide about $39 billion in unpaid care. What are some things that make these costs so high? Well, on top of that, they also pay out approximately $7,000 or more out of their pocket yearly to help maintain people in their homes. So it's both the time and the effort, but it's also the financial burden that these uh, caregivers take on and take on willingly with great dedication. And that's why we really have to support them. Because if people can't remain in their homes, they end up having to move into institutional care. And institutional care is the majority of those beds are paid for with Medicaid. And that means taxpayers and the government pay for that care. So we want to avoid that. Uh, especially when we know that people want to live in their own homes anyway. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I remember over a decade ago, my mother was a caregiver for her mother, and I just remember her always being out of the house and, you know, never really being home around this time. And there was, there was no support at that time for her specifically. So can you tell me what the AARP believes should be done to support these caregivers? Well, we, we feel like more attention needs to be paid. We feel that more money needs to go into home and community-based care to support these caregivers because in the end, as I said, it's going to save the state and the whole system much more money. We need to make sure that they are educated on things that can help make their job easier. In New York, we've been working on a caregiver tax credit uh, to allow people to be able to get money that they're laying out up, up to a certain amount as a tax credit back to them, which is a small way to help support what they're giving of themselves. We also want to make sure that they take care of themselves because there's so much stress on them. We want to make sure that they feel that they can advocate for themselves, that the doctors are informed and know that you know they have permission to hear about their loved one's uh, medical condition. The worst thing is to be surprised you're, you're, you're taking care of your mother. She goes to the doctor. The doctor gives her a prescription. Nobody tells you. You're the one who's handling her prescriptions. So then what happens? Like, mm -hmm. You can't be caught off guard. When you're a caregiver, you, you need to have all the information available to you so you feel confident that you can do the best possible job. So you must be in the communication loop with all health uh, professionals. Uh, another area is making sure that your loved one's home is safe. You know, that's one of the things that we don't always think about. Is there a rug that is not taped down that they could trip over? Is there mm -hmm. an electrical cord maybe from a lamp or something that's blocking a passageway that they could easily trip over? Are the stairs safe? Do they have safe treads on them? I mean, there's innumerable really good things that you can do that don't necessarily cost a lot of money that can ensure that your loved one is a lot safer. You know, they, people can go to uh, the AARP website and get a lot more information about this, too. They can go to uh, aarp.org forward slash caregiving and get all the information that they need about, you know, really how to fortify themselves, but how to make sure that what they're doing is supported. And there's so much great information out there for folks. You know, absolutely. And with that, I wanted to ask, how exactly, you know, may the AARP be going about this to fulfill this goal? Are there any specific programs that a caregiver can join? Are there anything, you know, that they can expect? 
Well, that's why I suggest they go on that AARP.org slash caregiving because it can give them all the information both at the national level and you can also see some advocacy pieces that we've been working at the national level. Um, and so, you know, we know that um, nationally, we, um, the, uh, pr the White House recently signed an executive order that provides um, for help for caregivers. Um, and we also, in New York, as I said before, we're always fighting for more money to go into home and community-based care because there's great providers all across New York State. In New York City, uh, all people have to do is call 311 and they can t say that they're a family caregiver and get support from uh, the New York City Department for the Aging, which has some great resources also. Last year, AARP advocated to get another $9 million into home and community-based care here in New York State. We need a lot more. Uh, we also need more money for folks who actually end up having to go into respite health or into long-term care. And we've been fighting to get more money in oversight for long-term care ombudsman program. We wanted $15 million this year. That's what we asked for because that's what would make sure that people, that uh, institutions were inspected properly. People put their loved ones in there expecting a certain quality of care. We only got 2.5 million. So we're going to come back out next year and, and try to up that number again because uh, we all know what happened during COVID when 15,000 people died in nursing homes in New York State. We can never let that happen again. Yeah. And I mean, you're at 2.5 million now, but it is only up from here. And so, you know, with that, I want to ask you, what are some steps that caregivers can take now to empower themselves and their loved ones? Well, it's what I mentioned before. First of all, cut yourself some slack. <laughs> Be forgiving of yourself. That's number one. We all try to do the very best we can do. Educate yourself, which again, go to aarp.org forward slash caregiving. Make sure that healthcare professionals know that uh, you need to be kept in the loop and sometimes you need to fill out some uh, forms or the patient needs to to make sure that um, you can get the information that you need and that you're going to get it in a timely manner. Uh, and finally, what I was saying before about making sure that your loved one's home is safe from any dangerous uh, things that could be there, like as I mentioned before, uh, taping down rugs, uh, making sure that lighting is good throughout the house. You know, very often uh, people don't put on lights because they want to save money on electricity. But if you can't really see where, well where you're going, you could easily trip over something or bang into something. And that's the last thing that we want. So again, there are a myriad of things that people can do. Many, very many that are low cost or no cost. Uh, put a, a higher uh, wattage... Uh, bulb in the lamps. I mean, really simple things that can make sure that a loved one is safer. Yeah, absolutely. And I really like that first piece of advice that you gave is cut yourself some slack. You know, it is important mm -hmm. as a caregiver to give yourself grace because you're not necessarily a healthcare professional, but you are stepping up and helping a family member. And that is, you know, the most important thing here. And uh, so, you know, I'm sorry. I mean, I just want to go back to what you said about your mother and how she was taking care of your grandmother and taking care of you. And, you know, that there's so many people out there in that sandwich generation who are going through that right now or who will go through that. So um, that's something really important that we have to think about and, and, and understand the pressures that these family members are under. Exactly. I mean, trying to take care of a household, trying to go to work and then take care of a loved one. It is a very stressful situation. And because of that, you know, I wanted to ask in your experience, what is the reception of these caregivers? You know, do you see some of them or most of them, unfortunately, might be going through stress? Do some of them maybe fe feel a bit of fulfillment to care for their loved ones? What is that like? Well, that's again why they really need to seek help. There's some great support services out there. There are, there are support groups. Uh, they can, or they might want to have, uh, you know, someone to talk to on their own. Uh, but it's really important that you get that help for yourself because if you uh, don't feel like you're getting what you need, then you're going to not be able to do everything that you need for your loved one. Uh, that's why respite services, which you, you know, ways that you can get temporary help. Uh, if 
you know, if you have want to go on vacation, I mean, a caregiver should be able to, you know, take a day at the beach. Everybody needs a, a bit of a day off. And so we need to make sure that those services are there for caregivers as they need them. Or, you know, God forbid they have to go to a funeral or something else. What are they going to do? Where's the backup to make sure that their loved ones are well cared for, that they can walk out of the house and feel confident that nothing terrible is going to happen? And that's why it's really important to plug into caregiver services locally. And there are a myriad of them here in New York City. So really recommend that people seek that out. 100%. And on that note, Bev, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. For more information, you can visit their website at aarp.org. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back with more Open right after this. the hard part. You quit smoking. Now do the easy part and get scanned for lung cancer. If you smoked, you may still be at risk, but early detection could save your life. Talk to your doctor and learn more at savedbythescan.org. Even though we didn't grow up together, he's my favorite brother. Hey, sis. I'm the baby of the family, and he's the gentle giant. What you know about poor Georgia? Man, please, that's a classic. Oh, you know when they say boys, people are a rare breed? Get off my yeah, he's that. I'm sorry, I'll be back in a few hours. Don't worry, Shag, you know I'm for you. I know. Go get the football. Yeah. That was my favorite memory. He was always for you. This is a true story of me, Bridget Floyd, and this guy, George Perry Floyd Jr., my big brother. Welcome back. Snap app is New York City's pioneering mobile app exclusively catering to food truck vendors and enthusiasts. The app enables customers connect to connect with fellow foodies, track their favorite food trucks in real time, order delivery, and receive it instant. Updates on food truck locations and offerings. Here now is the brand ambassador at Snap app, Christine Cruz. Christy, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Of course. So I am so excited to talk about this. Okay. Snab is the all-in-one food truck app. Tell me a little bit about it. What sets it apart? Okay. So Snab is basically like a foodie platform. Mm -hmm. um, it is very similar to the social media apps that everybody loves, but it is completely dedicated to food trucks. So you can order for a pickup, delivery, you can even book your favorite food truck for an event. And what sets us apart from uh, any other food truck delivery platform is that we have uh, basically developed like the, like I said, the social media aspect. Mm -hmm. So uh, foodies can get on and share their reviews and comments. And, you know, with that, food trucks are known for their mobility, which sometimes makes it challenging for customers to find their favorite products. So how does the Snap app address this issue? Definitely the real-time location. So whether your truck is typically posted at a specific spot mm -hmm. or if they have to move for whether it be uh, construction purposes or just um, more accessibility for them, you can track them in real time. And so, as you mentioned, there's a social media aspect to it, which, of course, we know consists of things of liking, commenting, sharing, following, that whole thing. So can you tell me how that has been able to create a community amongst foodies? Well, sharing is caring, right? So I might love spicy food, mm -hmm. but I only have one, uh, maybe a spicy food truck in my area. 
Um, but I can go on Snap and be like, hey, I'm going to be in Brooklyn today or, you know, I'm going to be in the Bronx today. Where else can I get spicy food at? So that definitely helps. I think that's so important. I feel like in today's time, everybody you know goes to a food spot because of somewhere they saw on social media. Right. So I think that's just so important. And with so many food delivery options available today, what benefits does SNAP offer to both food truck operators and customers? Um, well, the feedback, right? Mm -hmm. um, so like when I was actually doing some brand awareness, I had never tried a I hope I'm not saying this wrong, Pampuri, like mm -hmm. Indian food. Yeah. And it was like, I saw all the customers and that was like the one main thing that they were ordering. And I was like, oh, I must need to try mm -hmm. this, right? It was like their number one dish. So it's just basically, you know, bringing awareness of things that you probably might have never heard of. Right. And would you say it fosters a deeper connection? Absolutely. Um, it just... It gives you access and uh, just awareness to different cultures and foods that you probably wouldn't even thought of trying. Yeah. And, you know, SNAP not only offers food delivery, but also provides pickup options, which, once again, I think in today's time, nobody waits online anymore. Like, right. I'm a mobile order person. I don't, know, I don't know about you, but, like, mobile order is the way to go. So how does this feature cater to the needs of users who prefer the convenience of takeout while still supporting their favorite food trucks? So, uh, like... The lunch rush, right? Right. Yeah. So if you only have 30 minute break and you see that the line for your favorite food truck might be like down the block, you can get on Snap and just beat the line basically. Mm -hmm. um, so not only do you not have to worry about paying um, for it in person, you can just pay for it on the app and then your food is already ready for you. That's amazing. Right? That is, it's I awesome. think. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And so, you know, as you mentioned earlier, you know, you're finding this deeper connection with foodies and you're able to try new things. And because of that, you know, New York City, we're known for the diverse cul culinary scene and the diverse culture. So how has SNAB adapted to unique food truck culture and what strategies, if any, is the app using to kind of target users? Um, so we've pounded the pavement a lot um, mm -hmm. just as far as onboarding vendors and just spreading the word to customers so we have uh, went all over through the five boroughs and just making people aware that the app is here um, to sign up not only actual food trucks but customers um, and you know the like I said the whole foodie aspect and mm -hmm. being able to share those opinions virtually is just has been amazing it's funny. So speaking of the, the foodie community, can you elaborate a little bit more on how Snap encourages users to share their experience? So you can actually create a profile right now. Mm -hmm. um, so just like any other social media um, app, you can put up your picture, you can put up a bio, what exactly you're into. Uh, people can leave comments and reviews and share things. And we're working on a lot of uh, developing a lot of other aspects to mm. that so i have to ask i'm very interested so like how does this work are you like sh like posting pictures of your food are you like maybe sharing a status or something or right how does that so work? we are constantly in development and mm -hmm. um we're going to be just like any other social media that you can follow your favorite foodie um you can share live feeds okay. um just interactions yeah a lot of interactions that's so cool. And, you know, after the pandemic, supporting local businesses is so important, especially for the food trucks that often represent small independent entrepreneurs. So how does SNAP contribute to the growth and sustainability of local food vendors? Um, broadening their customer base, right? Um, so like I said, if, especially if you travel along within the city and you can be from, they can bounce around from one borough to the next. And also we actually provide probably the lowest commission rates that are out there and, you know, in comparison to like Grubhub and mm -hmm. other uh, delivery applications. And also we have same day payout and not a lot of other apps do that. So we're just trying to not only work on the customer side, but on the vendor side mm -hmm. as well. I think that's so important to be able to balance both sides. And like you said, with same day payout, I think that is so important yes, for local absolutely. businesses. Cause a lot of times, you know, you're waiting a week, two weeks for payment and sometimes emergencies happen, things happen, you need absolutely. the money in that moment. So I think it's really important to be able to, hey, get that money at the end of the day. And I think it's also like a little incentive also. Exactly. 
It's like, hey, like I'm going to go to work today. I'm going to make some money today. Right. So I think that's really good. And so, you know, in terms of safety and reliability, of course, how does SNAP ensure that food truck delivery orders are handled securely and efficiently and, you know, provide a positive experience for both sides? So the food trucks can actually prov uh, provide their own delivery people, mm -hmm. and we actually have our own team of uh, delivery services. So it's not like... Um, like Uber Eats, that it's just random, like whoever's okay. uh, the closest, we actually onboard, we have an extensive background check, we have meetings, so our delivery guys absolutely know our code of conduct, how they're supposed to communicate with not only the vendors, but with the customers as well. Well, I think that is so important, and like you said, with other bigger um, apps, we're not seeing that. And a lot of times, and I've seen on social media so many times, where people get their food and their food is tampered with, their bags are Horror open. Horror story. Right, like things are yes. open. I mean, there's times where I'll receive like a Diet Coke or something, and then the, the stickers puncture. I'm like, wait a minute. Now I don't feel right. safe drinking this. So I right. think that is so important, and I think, you know, so with that, are there any maybe background checks or anything? Yes. Okay. Extensive background checks. Once again, so important. And Food truck culture often celebrates innovation and unique cul culinary creation. So how does SNAP showcase the creativity and diversity of the food truck scene? So um, we are actually uh, cultivating a whole bunch of food truck festivals okay. throughout New York. Um, and we're just trying to broaden our horizons, not only here in the city, but all over the United States. So we are just making a whole bunch of different connections with a whole bunch of organizations. Uh, there's like Food Truck Fridays and a, a whole bunch of affiliations to make sure that we have the most variety that you can get out there. I like that idea of the festivals. Can you tell me just a little bit more about that? Oh, we... We're like a, the best block party you can possibly okay. think of with food trucks. So we're talking about like DJs, uh, photo booths, a lot of music, uh, other variety of vendors, just to bring the community together so they can experience, uh, again, a lot of uh, businesses that they probably would have never experienced just walking around. That is such a fun idea. And once again, you know, just another great way to network, to kind yes. of show off these brands. I think it's... A really nice thing to have and so as SNAP continues to grow and expand its services what future developments or enhancements could we look forward to um, just we are really like bootstrapped with making sure that there's improvements within the app like daily so a lot of um, analysis data analysis we make sure that we're saving customers information their likes their reviews so the food truck can get um, the best um, I guess knowledge of their reviews, what they can do better, what can we do better as providing customer service for both sides, for our customers and for the vendors. That's great. And as we wrap up, I want to ask, what's the feedback from customers been like? It's just like, it's amazing because like I said, there's um, certain food trucks, like if they're stationary, then I already know you're going to be on this block, on this corner, but sometimes they decide to move, like on the weekends. Mm -hmm. So it's great to always know where your favorite food truck is at. And then you can uh, see what is in the same culinary, like same cuisine, like, oh, I want Mexican today, but uh, maybe my favorite food truck is not going to be at the spot that I'm at on mm -hmm. that day. But hey, there's another similar Mexican spot, and it has amazing reviews. I'm going to go check that one out. So it's just a lot of accessibility and bringing a whole bunch of different food trucks to light. Yeah, I, well, I know what I'm doing when I get out of here. <laughs> I know what app I'm downloading. But awesome. on, on that note, Christina, I want to thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you for having me. Of course. So for more information, you can visit this website at snap.cool and follow them on social media at snap.cool. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back with more open right after this. You're so sad. You've got a roof over your head. Bro, you gotta stop with that depression stuff. That's a white people thing. Escúchame, en esta casa, los hombres no lloran. You alright? It just feels like it's coming from everywhere. Do you want to talk about it? Thanks for hearing me out, bro. Appreciate it. You can talk to me if you're feeling sad. 
Whenever you need to talk, I'm here, okay? Attacks against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are on the rise. My simple solution to the problem was remove people from the scene and help them feel safer. In terms of the hate crimes, I think there is so much more work to be done. We really need to come together and tackle this issue as a community. Welcome back. Teacher burnout has become a prevalent phenomenon significantly affecting the dedicated men and women who are shaping the future of our students. We had the ability to sit down with the founder and CEO of Boogie Down Books, Rebecca Schof, and New York City principal and author Meredith Matson to discuss their book, Education with Passion and Purpose. Let's take a look. Thank you for having us. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Yeah, of course. So just to start off, can you both tell me a little bit more about your background as educators and what led you to write this book? Sure. So I started as a high school English teacher in New York City Public Schools in 2003. And um, after about 10 years in the classroom as a classroom teacher, Meredith and I had the opportunity together to be lead teachers at our school, which meant that we taught about half of what a regular teaching load was. And we used the rest of our time to mentor new teachers, coach our colleagues, and lead professional development for the entire faculty every Wednesday. And it was a really, really amazing experience for both of us. We had both been teachers for about 10 years, but believe it or not, we were actually veterans at our school at that point. And we felt like through this experience of teacher leadership, we were really learning a lot about how to avoid burnout, which so many teachers experience, and how to address it even when it does start to creep in. And so we had this idea for the book. But other things happened, life got in the way, we both pursued other professional opportunities, and it wasn't until the pandemic, actually, when we finally had the time to start writing the book. Meredith, do you wanna tell the rest of the story? Yeah, so during the um, pandemic, as Rebecca said, all of a sudden we had found ourselves in this weird situation where we had time. And so what we started to do was Zoom once a week, and we would just kind of give ourselves different topics that we would wanna talk about, write about, and what we realized was the process that we were going through actually was quite, um, in many ways, therapeutic for both of us as educators. And it really gave us this sense for this book. And we realized that as our stories were being told and as we were reflecting on our stories, we felt like this could be such a powerful thing for educators everywhere, um, which led us to really formulating all of our thoughts and ideas into this book about reducing teacher burnout and really trying to help teachers and educators connect to their why, their purpose, why they get into this work every single day. Yeah, absolutely. So Rebecca, can you tell me a little bit about what inspired you to focus on the theme of purpose and passion in education? Absolutely. So when Meredith and I started writing the book, we thought that we were writing a book more strictly about burnout. But while we were engaging in this process, as Meredith was explaining, of reflecting on our own experiences of burnout and the experiences that we've had coaching and leading other teachers who have been experiencing burnout, we started to realize that actually we weren't really writing about burnout itself. We were writing about purpose. And we were writing about how to help educators connect to, and in some cases reconnect to, the reason why they became educators in the first place. And what we uncovered is that for many teachers, burnout starts to set in when there's a misalignment between their purpose, their why, the reason why they wanted to be educators initially, and their reality, what they're experiencing right now. And so the key or one key to avoiding burnout or addressing it once it sets in is really connecting to purpose and using that purpose as a litmus test for decision making to ensure that your actions, your experiences and your reality really are aligned with your purpose. I think that's amazing. And I think that's a great way to, in a way, you know, find that silver lining within all of this. So specifically finding your passion, even though you are in this phase of burnout. So with that, Meredith, I want to ask you in the press release, it mentions that your book aims to help educators stay engaged with their purpose. So could you elaborate on how educators can maintain that sense of purpose, you know, amid the challenges they face? Yeah. So what we really believe is that teachers and educators need to 
have a very clear understanding of why they're in this work and then think about ways to integrate that why into as many aspects of the job. So for an example, we have a whole chapter in the book about curriculum and what we teach. And we also have... I can jump in here. So each chapter of the book has a different focus. Mm -hmm. And as Meredith was saying, one of those chapters is curriculum. We also have a chapter on instruction. We have one on being the lead learner. We have one on forming a network or a community and also finding your professional home. And in each of those chapters, we take the reader through each of our personal stories with our experiences around that topic. And then we have a set of prompts and activities and and reflective exercises for the reader to use to think about how their purpose aligns with that topic or how that that topic connects to their purpose. The kinds of decisions, the kinds of actions, the kinds of conversations, the kinds of reflective work, and some sometimes the, the difficult decisions that they might need to make in order to bring their reality into alignment with their purpose. Additionally, we have a section at the end of each chapter that's especially for leaders who are supporting teachers through professional development, um, as supervisors, as um, principals or school leaders or district leaders, and the kinds of things that they can do to help support teachers to reconnect to their purpose and their passion and avoid or address burnout as well. I think that's such a cool thing to have within the book. You're not just reading. It's not like it's just a self-help book, but it really is personalized with these prompts and these activities. So I think that's such a great thing to add. And, you know, you spoke a little bit about the different concepts and the different chapters within the book. So with that, Meredith, I want to ask you, you know, the book addresses things like race, privilege and well-being. So why did you feel that it was so important to include these different aspects um, in the discussion of educating with passion and purpose? So I think it is so essential that educators are um, very self-reflective on their own identity and how their own identity impacts them as educators and impacts their students. And especially, you know, I am a white woman and I've been leading a school in New York City with a very, very diverse community background. And it's so important that my community um, is that their identity is truly uplifted within the classes within the school that I teach at. And so when you're working through as an educator, what is your passion? What's your purpose? We have to think about the students that are in front of us and we have to make sure that that truly aligns with what, what you're working on because we owe it to our students to make sure that they are the forefront of the classroom. And so we really talk about that in the book very explicitly. And we talk about, again, different prompts for educators to think through to make sure that they have an equity stance when they're working with their students because their students deserve the very best educators out there for them that are there to advocate for, for their um, thinking within the classroom. That's amazing. And lastly, I want to ask the both of you, what do you hope readers will take away from your book and how do you envision it making a positive impact on the teaching profession? I could say I really hope that educators are able to deeply connect to their own personal stories. You know, in the book, Rebecca and I both are very vulnerable and tell our stories. But like Rebecca said, there are prompts throughout the book. And I hope that educators are able to use those prompts and ask themselves and make sure that they're in a space and a place and that they're teaching really deeply connected to why they're doing it because I truly believe that education is one of the most difficult jobs out there but that we have to really show up every single day for our students and so in order to do that and to do that well and to do it with um, just as much commitment as possible we got to make sure that we are aligned with why we're doing this and I think that's some of the best self-help that there is and that educators can truly do for themselves. And I would just add, we really want to help support educators to stay in the profession in a sustainable way. We know that there are so many systemic and structural issues that create conditions that are really untenable for teachers throughout much of this country. And there are institutional and labor organizations that are working to change those structural issues that desperately need change. In the meantime, there are teachers in schools doing, as Meredith said, the hardest work, the most important work in our society right now. And they need support right now. 
And so our hope is that this book will help educators who may be experiencing burnout or may not be experiencing burnout, but might in the future if they don't have a pathway to do the work in a sustainable manner. And so our hope is that the book doesn't just provide sort of immediate reflective experiences, although we know that that will be the case too, but rather that there are some practices that will help with mindset shifts and decision-making that can create long-term change for individual educators and individual school communities that will allow educators to do the work that they love, that they feel called to do in a sustainable long-term way so that students can have experienced, passionate, and purposeful teachers in front of them every day. This is gonna be such a great tool. Thank you both for coming on here and uh, discussing this with us. Thank you for having Thank you so us. Much. For more information, you can visit the website at beatingteacherburnout.com. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back with more Open right after this. One of the deadliest mass shootings in U.S. history at Post Nightclub in Orlando. Walking into the building for the first time after the shooting, it was crippling but it had to be preserved. If you're an ally of this community, speak out. There are more of us together than apart. It is the power of love in its rawest form. Fostering a pet for a friend or neighbor can keep families together. Learn more at petsandpeopletogether.org. Most hiring algorithms would scream me out. Some bosses couldn't see me as a leader. I've run this place for 20 years, but I still need to prove that I'm more than what you see on paper. I've been running code as long as I've been able to reach a keyboard. This is what I do. It's second nature for me, coordinating 100 details at once. It's the way my mind works. I have a very mechanical brain. I sold them on my skills. You gotta be so good they can't ignore you. My magic is... Analytics and empathy. That's how I'm getting clients. You have to have the confidence in yourself to show up and defy the odds. I'm more than who I am on paper. I never got a college degree. And today, I'm the CEO of my own company. People want to tell me I'm one in a million when actually I'm one of millions. The stars are all around us. It's time for them to shine. Welcome back. The City Island Oyster Reef is a nonprofit organization dedicated to enhancing oyster reef restoration in New York City. By re-establishing oyster populations around City Island, their ultimate objective is to boost water quality, fortify shorelines against storm surges and flooding, and revive the diverse ecosystem historically linked to the region. Joining us now is the Secretary of the Board of Directors at City Island Oyster Reef, Barbara Byrne Dolensek. Barbara, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. So just to start off, can you tell me a little bit more about the City Island Oyster Reef and elaborate a little bit on its mission? Well, um, it, we founded about four years ago uh, when it became um, uh, clear that City Island had a very old oyster history. Uh, apparently, most of the um, oyster industry, which was enormous in the 19th century, actually started on City Island with the uh, construction of of uh, reefs to enhance the natural reefs. And so uh, I am also an officer at the City Island Nautical Museum, and we um, uh, put our heads together and thought that actually restoring reefs would be a wonderful way of bringing back oysters into the areas, the waters around City Island. Um, unfortunately, um, the, you can't eat oysters out of these waters because they are still polluted. Um, but we know that oysters can clean 50 gallons of water a day and uh, that they also can build up reefs that will prevent storm surges, which is a concern, you know, during, during this whole um, uh, fear of, of climate change and rising tides on City Island, which is a big issue for most of us. Absolutely. And as you just mentioned a little bit about climate change, so can you tell me about how the condition of oyster reefs impacts the quality of water? 
Well, again, because the individual oysters do clean an enormous amount of water a day, along with ribbed, ribbed mussels, which um, are also exist on the shoreline. The problem, of course, now is that City Island, like many other areas on Long Island Sound, is surrounded with um, seawalls and, um, and buildings and other um, um, you know, pieces of construction that, in, in, uh, that mean that the oyster uh, restoration is not that easy. However, we've tested the water quality all around City Island. We have applied for funding uh, that we have received, uh, which will enable us to test further. We have oyster cages full of um, oysters. Baby oysters are usually um, fertilized uh, by their parents in the water. And then they go and join up with other oyster shells or with oysters. And that's how a reef is formed. And we thought that if we could study how that happens and, um, and make oysters available, we collect shells from restaurants here and we um, cure them in the open air for about a year. Then they are covered with spat, which are baby oysters. <clears throat> and then we've been putting them in boxes all around City Island. These have been uh, d donated by the Building Oyster Project, which is doing much of the same activity in New York Harbor. Uh, we consider ourselves um, a separate organization, although we rely on them a lot for their expertise. But our main, one of our main issues really is enlightening the community around us. Um, I'm old enough now that I'm not gonna see a lot of climate change improvement. Uh, in my lifetime. However, the youngsters at PS 175, for example, and at other schools around the Bronx, they, the more they learn about what oysters can do and about how important oyster reefs are, biodiversity, which means bringing in other kinds of creatures that live naturally in this area but have been moved away because of pollution. So this educational component is really a very important part of what we do. So we like to get the public involved. We get them involved by doing fundraisers, by having uh, our water jubilee, which is coming up on August 5th, uh, which gets a lot of kayakers and young people involved. Um, it's a, uh, we're very busy all the time, it seems to me. Um, we're all volunteers. We don't get paid for what we do. We do hire interns, um, young kids. We've had lots of help from the Boy Scouts. We've created a learning center behind PS 175 on the water, belongs to the Parks Department, but we've been able to clear out the Japanese knotweed, all the garbage that accumulates um, on a daily basis. And, um, uh, and we really um, have a very dedicated group of board members and advisors who, uh, uh, who you know, we, we again apply for funding, but we've got some very important funders, and we are recognized by the Long Island Sound Futures Fund as a very important um, uh, movement um, in Western Long Island Sound, which has been uh, neglected um, over the years. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in a little bit, I do want to get to your um, shell collection movement as well as your educational initiatives at PS 175. But for now, when I was reading a little bit earlier, I saw that, you know, the organization mentions that it's not necessarily about improving drinking water, but more so marine environment around City Island. So can you elaborate a little bit on this and the significance on this? Well, of course, it's not about drinking water since, you know, we don't drink the salt water. Uh, but what it does, what we would like to do is to increase the, cl the cleanliness of the water for swimming, for boating, uh, for, again, as I say, biodiversity. Um, we have problems with the Hutchinson River, which is quite polluted and pours right into East Chester Bay. Um, we know that the Health Department of New York City will test the water periodically and find it every now and then after a big uh, thunderstorm where there's been a lot of rain that suddenly sewage pours into the waters around here. Um, we're just hoping that if we can establish oyster reefs in anything like the quantity that they were during the 19th century, um, the water quality would just be that much improved. It would be um, uh, a miracle in a way. 
uh, but we can't stop trying. And I think that um, once everybody begins to understand, that's the importance of the education of involving the community. Is is as soon as people begin to understand that um, uh, that what we're doing is really about improving. Uh, our chances to survive uh, climate change, uh, then I think that we get a lot of support that way. It's non-political. It's completely um, uh, uh, located. I mean, it's city island. It has to do with the community, um, but it also has very strong support from scientists and um, uh, and people who are on our board, who are scientists, who who are able to interpret the information that we get from uh, monitoring the water quality. Um, every, every weekend during the summertime, we are out there on our skiff uh, improving or, you know, testing the water, testing the number of, of oysters that have uh, either died or have increased their size. We measure each new baby as it, as it grows. Um, all of this is very, is, is very carefully documented and so we use that and not only in our fundraising but also in speaking to um, to teachers and in speaking to um, members of the community who care a lot a lot of people here on city island love to swim they love to kayak they love to paddleboard they love to sail and um and they care about the quality of the water which is a very important um if you live on the water you have to care <laughs> Yeah, I mean, of course, absolutely. And so, you know, with that, you mentioned a little bit about teachers. And so I want to speak about your educational component, which you kind of already mentioned a lot about. So can you tell me when somebody signs up for one of your educational webinars, what can they expect? Well, the educational webinars have been on various and sundry different subjects. Um, so some of them are quite are quite specific and quite scientific, and some of them are quite general. I just finished one on the history of oystering on City Island. Most people are completely unaware of how important City Island was in the whole um, development of the of the oyster industry. We a man from um, Connecticut named Orrin Fordham moved here in 1830 and invented a system of planting oysters, of planting reefs, and um, and that is part of City Island's history. The Billion Oyster Project is a fabulous organization in New York Harbor, and they have done enormous amount of work. Uh, to try their idea of the billion oysters is to have a billion oysters in New York Harbor by 2035. And we have uh, learned a lot from them, not only educationally, but in terms of using oyster, these oyster cases that we, uh, in which we store oysters in the water. Um, and they've helped us with their educational program too. They've taught our interns and our board members a great deal about how to proceed. Um, but we do, we are an independent group and, um, but, you know, we live on an island. City Island is, is kind of special in that way. Um, we are, um, we are part of the Bronx and we're proud to be part of the Bronx, but we're also our own place. <laughs> Absolutely. I feel like in just this short amount of time, I've learned so much. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but on that note, Barbara, I want to thank you so much for speaking with us today. Great. Well, it was fun. And thank you so much for your good questions. <laughs> thank you. So for more information, you can visit the website at ciOysterReef.org and follow them on Facebook at City Island Oyster Reef. We've come to the end of our show today. I'd like to thank all of our guests for joining and you, the viewers, for tuning in. If you missed any part of today's show, you can catch the re-cable cast on Optimum Channel 67, Verizon Fios 2133, or watch anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. This wraps up this episode for us. I'm Brittany Schuyler-Albain. Make sure to keep this channel wide open. Take care.